Hello and welcome to episode 35 of The Thing About Golf, the podcast series from Golf Australia magazine which explores the myriad reasons that people get hooked on this absurd game. My name's Rod Murray, and along with John Huggan, we bring you these interviews every two weeks featuring guests ranging from top players to administrators to everyday golfers with a passion for the game. On this episode, we're in for a real treat because Huggy has caught up with a player who's not just one of my favourites, but I suspect a favourite of many around the world. There's not much that Dame Laura Davies hasn't done in golf, yet she remains one of the most down-to-earth people one could imagine. John Huggan joins me to help introduce, introduce this episode. And Huggy, I was pretty excited when you told me Laura had agreed to sit down and be interviewed for the show. I wasn't disappointed. I'd imagine this is one that you enjoyed quite a bit also. Well, it's not the first time I've, I've talked to Laura. I mean, and but you're right. She, she's certainly one of my favourites. Um, down to earth is, is the best description of her. She just, if you ask her a question, she, she gives you, tells you what she thinks, which is, uh, sounds simple, but uh, not too many of the elite players, certainly the male players, do that these days. Uh, they tend to hum and haw and they've been coached into saying this or that, uh-huh. but there's none of that with Laura. She just tells you straight. Well, not only that, she has a sense of humour about it. So it's a it's a fabulous sort of trait about her, isn't it? Because she can laugh at herself, she can be self-deprecating. I'm not sure that anybody, whilst absolutely she deserves it, you just can't imagine Laura Davies being a dame. And I think she probably thinks the same. It's a strange. Well, I, I think I think she does deserve it, and I'll tell oh, you no why. We, we touched on this in the interview that without Laura Davis, I, I maintain that there would not be a ladies' European tour mm-hmm. today. Yep. Back back in the day when Laura was clearly the best player in the world, she spent an inordinate amount of time coming back to Europe when she didn't have to to play in tournaments. And I'm sure she got expenses and a bit of cash, but she came back. She played in these events for you know hardly any money, uh, mm. prize money, and kept them going. There, as I say, there, there would not be a tour today if it wasn't for Laura Davis. And that, again, is the reason why Laura Davis isn't in the LPGA Hall of Fame. I think she's one point or two points short yeah. of the, the cutoff. And the reason for that is because she spent too much time playing in Europe. If Had she stayed in America full time, she would have won umpteen more tournaments than she has done. So she deserves a huge amount of credit. I com- completely agree. Do we forget, Huggy, what a talent she is and was? It happens in golf, well, yeah, doesn't it? Ha- yeah, I mean, she had a huge advantage. I mean, the- Laura's a big girl, and-, and she hit it miles back in the day when she was, I mean, not only the best player, but she was clearly the longest player. <clears throat> and as we've seen, you know, as that's only been exacerbated by the the way equipment's gone the last 20 years. But since then, that's now a bigger advantage than it, than it was then. But still... She stood out a mile in so many ways on that tour. Yeah, yeah, indeed. My favourite part in this whole – well, there's a couple of favourite parts in this, Huggy. First of all, she can come and sit with us in the grumpy old golfer's club. She's anti-hybrid, and she still carries her two iron, so she's okay by us. Yeah. And that was a that was a fabulous exchange you had about that. But my favourite part of the whole interview was when she uttered these words, oh, I disagree with you, which I thought yes. was just fabulous. You never hear that from well, me, I- do you? Yeah, I, I welcome that too. I mean, <clears throat> to me, excuse me, that's the the whole point of these things is that too many interviews now. It's just you know everybody's you can't agree all the time. I mean, sometimes I even disagree with you, Rod. So I mean, it's all good stuff. How dare you, Huggy? After everything we've been through together, now you're absolutely right. It is in fact it is the only way forward, isn't it? Is to be exposed to the opposite point of view or a different point of view from time to time. We'll get into the interview in a moment, Huggy. I'm going to tell you a little, tell you a little story that I think sums up Laura perfectly, and I just wonder whether you agree with me. I think you will. Uh, years ago, it was probably ten years ago, maybe more, at a Women's Australian Open, I was lurking around the bar where all the the caddies and the players were coming in after their rounds, and you know. They were sort of sitting and having a drink or some lunch or whatever. And I never forget Laura walked off the course with her caddy. He put the bag down in the beer garden and she reached into the bag, pulled out a wallet and said to him, what do you want? Asked five other caddies what they wanted and she went to the bar, got the beers, came back with a tray full of beers and put them on the table. And I thought, I can't think of too many should-be Hall of Fame players who would have done that. I think that sums her up perfectly. Yeah, I I believe everything you just said, especially the bit about you locking around the bar. (laughs) You know me far too well, Huggy, far too well. Let's get into Dame Laura Davies, one of the greats of the game. Huggy, thank you for this. I'm glad, as I said, I'm sure you enjoyed it at least as much as we're going to, but a fabulous interview, and I'm sure the listeners will love it too. It was my pleasure. Laura Davies, thank you very much for uh, joining us on the Thing About Golf podcast. Um, First question is really obvious. Um, How are you coping with this not so wonderful and rather strange world we're all living in at the moment. 
Well, I think, it, you know, it's the same for everybody, just frustrating. But, you know, you, you just have to back the authorities and, and do what they tell you to do. And hopefully the sooner sooner we get out of it, obviously the better. But it's not fun, let's face it. No, absolutely not. Are you, you're in England, obviously, at the moment. I mean, you, and you can't play golf right now. I know, really disappointing. Uh, you know, just obviously I'm, I'm playing in a tournament in America in about six weeks and I'm hoping sooner rather than later we get uh, the all clear to go and start playing golf again so I can practice. I mean, I am allowed to practice because of, I don't know, some elite sports status, but with no golf courses open, I can't do that. So, uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just hoping it, it, that I noticed they've let fishing back on. So maybe golf's the next one in line to come back just so we can go and play a few holes. Well, I, I, maybe to, I've said this to you before, Laura, but you should be moving to Scotland because you can play golf up here at the moment. I know. I, I, I wish I was up there. I would I would play for sure. I mean, then that'd be nice. Well, that's right. Be quite right. quiet there at the moment. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you're an r and member, I should, uh, just for the people who don't know. Have you taken advantage of that yet? Not really, because I'm still playing such a lot. And I, I, I took uh, three of my friends up from the local village that I play a lot of golf with, a fair bit of golf with in the summer when I'm home. And about two years ago, we went up there and played. And uh, yeah, no, it was magnificent. But because I travel so much, the last thing I want to do when I get home normally is go and play golf. So it's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll wait till I, till I slow down a bit. Yeah, so you, they, they can expect to see you at the autumn meeting at some point in the future then? Oh, I can think of nothing better. I'll have to buy myself a little flat up there somewhere so I well, can really abuse the, yeah, yeah. the lovely membership. Now, just just for interest, I, mean, they, I know the members all get to wear the uh, the club tie, but uh, what, what do the women get to? What's the equivalent of the tie for a woman member? It's a nice scarf. It's in uh, in my uh, drawer over there with all my other little knickknacks. So yeah, hopefully one day I'll get up there and uh, put the put the little scarf on. It's like a little knick neckerchief thing. It's, right. it's very very really quite nice. Yes, I'm sure it's very fetching. Yes, it is very much so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, Laura, I'm going to drag you back right to the beginning. Uh, th- this uh, podcast is called the Thing About Golf. Um, right back at the start, what was the thing about golf for you? Uh, well, I started playing with my brother, he was older brother, three years older than me, and he used to play a lot. And I thought, I, I loved all sports, so I just decided, uh, you know, I'll have a go. I, 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 um, I think I was about 14 when I first started playing properly um, and just used to go to with the local courses with my brother and a little nine-hole course at Sandown Race Course in the middle. We used to play there. And I just enjoyed the fact that you never had the better of it. It was just one of those sports that you could always improve on. And um, you could play on your own if you wanted to. You'd go out with your mates if you wanted to. And it just the whole the whole aspect aspect of it really did appeal to me. And how quickly did it become apparent that uh, you were a promising youngster, put it that way? Well, I left school at 16 to pursue. I had some winter jobs and played the amateur circuits um, from when I was 16. So I only, I only played as an amateur two years before, uh, played the game for two years before I decided that was the the WPGA as it was in those days was was uh, had been formed in the mid seventies I think so I knew there was somewhere to play um, and I just fancied the idea of not having to work for a living just go and play a sport it was a lovely idea and yeah. it's, you know it's worked out. How did you support yourself uh, during your amateur career? Well, I had five uh, five winter jobs. I had three three years at Sainsbury's in the freezer department. I used to like <laughs> that. Um, I worked for a bookmaker. One of my, I used to work about six, seven months a year, and then play golf the other five months. So, and I worked at a petrol station, you know, just taking the money um, behind the counter at a petrol station. So I had five winter jobs, and luckily, obviously, my parents, my stepdad, and, and my mum Rita, and uh, stepdad Mike, and my dad, uh, you know, they they helped me out, which was obviously what you need yeah. for all those long journeys as an amateur, where you're just spending and not getting anything back. And how would you sum up your amateur career? I know you you it climaxed with a Curtis Cup appearance, but um, I'm not sure people know much about what you did before you started playing for money. Uh, pretty average. I think I won a couple of Southeastern Championships down here in Surrey, being this part of the world. Um, won an Intermediates, which was, it was just a level below the British amateur and the English amateur and stuff like that. But won that. Beat, I think I beat Ali Nicholas in the final, which was obviously a huge feather in my cap because... She was a couple of years older and obviously well established in the amateur game. So, yeah, no, I, I would say I was average um, in amateur days, but uh, you know, it still didn't stop you from from chancing your arm. Hopefully, one day in the pro ranks. 
And uh, wh- when did it sort of occur to you that, well, obviously, you say you're average. I mean, I'm, I'm taking that with a pinch of salt because you don't get in the Curtis Cup if you're average. Um, so you're obviously better than that. I mean, sorry, go on. I didn't used to win. I suppose that's what I mean. I, I base everything in sport on winning. And I, did, I wasn't a big winner in the amateur game. I was steady. I was, you know, consistently up there in, in the stroke play events. So I suppose that's where my Curtis Cup spot came from. But I wasn't what I would call a prolific winner. And what was the Curtis Cup like? Oh, I, I remember it as one of the best times of my life because obviously all the players on the team were all really good friends of mine from the amateur days, and we got flogged in the end. We had a, we had half a chance during the the start of the singles, but gradually we uh, we got beaten beaten down because they were a very very strong American side. I won my singles match amazingly against oh, God, I've forgotten her name now, and I shouldn't do because she was one of the very top match players, American amateur match players. Anyway, I beat her incredibly in my singles. Um, but I just remember it being a really good week and a big party at the end of it, and it was just a great time. It, it always struck me, and I was there watching that um, back in 1984 at Muirfield. It, it struck me as slightly odd even then that the the biggest event in women's amateur golf in, in Great Britain was being played at an all-male club. Did, did that thought ever occur to you at the time? Well, all I remember was we weren't allowed in the clubhouse because they've got grey walls. <laughs> Yeah. You know, right next to it, obviously. That's where we were based. All the players and all the all the uh, all the um, functions were at Greywall. So, but we weren't actually allowed in the clubhouse, which was, I suppose, at the time I couldn't have cared less. I mean, how old was I? Twenty one, something like that. Yeah. The men members don't want us in the clubhouse, and so be it. I really don't care. I, I was just so pleased to play Muirfield, and it's actually the only time I've ever played Muirfield. Ah, it's, it's certainly one of the great golf courses. Oh, I, I think it's fantastic. I love I love it when the Open's there. It's it's a really top class venue. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, um, so how soon after the Curtis Cup did you actually turn pro? Um, well, I turned pro on February thirteenth, nineteen eighty five. So not that long. I suppose the Curtis Cup was maybe Septemberish, uh, August September. I'm not quite sure. So right. within six months, um, myself and Julie Brown, one of my good mates from the amateur days, we both signed our pro papers on the same day. We did it and sent 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 a forms off in those days there was no internet no clicking links and all that marvelous stuff we can do now it's uh it was just what it was and yeah that was us pros then um it, it seems to me you know certainly back then that, that was a pretty brave move for a for a woman i mean there wasn't a lot of money knocking about on the women's tour in europe and you know you really had to think about america i mean how where was your thinking as you did that well, um, America wasn't even on the horizon for me. I was just hoping I could stay afloat and play the next week. My mum and stepdad lent me a thousand pounds, and you know that's that's all they could afford. And they went out on a limb to do that because we, you know, we didn't come from big money um, in my, you know, my when we were growing up. But everyone was very comfortable. But you know, a thousand pounds basically it a shot to nothing really because at that stage, who knows what you're going to do? But luckily, I finished second at the Hennessy. My very second tournament paid them their thousand back and I don't really you know ever remember worrying about next week so how can I afford to travel to the next tournament sort of thing and then after that win I got IBM as a sponsor and you know things just didn't become easy but I had a really good first couple of years won the money list in both my first seasons and that just takes the pressure off then won the US Open in my third season and that got me out to America on a, on a, and that was the first time I really thought about the LPGA because, you know, there were Nancy Lopez, Betsy King, all the big stars. I never even considered uh, competing with them. But once I'd won the US Open, things changed. Yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> looking back, I mean, the the way you played, I mean, the, or the, the style of game that you had, or certainly the distance you hit the ball, seemed to me that back then was a, how big of an advantage did you get from that? Oh, I think it was, I think just growing up playing with my brother and it was, I was being out hit by them because they were older and they were boys and the people I was playing with. So I tended to throw myself at the ball and I think that's where my game came from. So very lucky that I didn't have a coach early on telling me to have this beautiful swing and everything. And I was just very aggressive. Um, and that that's where my game's always been, even to this day when, when I, you know, when I play, I never play safe. I always go for the shots because... I'd rather fail trying than just cruise along and never quite get there. So that's that's always been my mantra, and uh, I don't see why it's worth stopping that now. Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with that philosophy. I've I've never understood the um, and you hear it a lot from from players, both men and women, top players, that they they kind of search for more consistency, 
I mean, I've never really understood that. As I say, I think you know you're better to hit four or five home runs and win a season than come eighth every week. And clearly, that's how you looked at it. Yeah, I was never one of the, I, my my finishes could be win, miss cut, fifty eighth, third, win, miss cut, miss cut. That rather than the the bog standard seventh, tenth, twentieth, fifth, that sort of finish. I was I was never that kind of player that was ever going to string together a huge winning run, a, a huge long long run of tournaments without missing cuts but never really challenging the top of the leaderboard so that I was not interested in that I was only ever interested in winning and and I think if you don't have that winning mentality it's hard to all of a sudden change the way you are and all and start trying to win tournaments if you if you're just there to basically make a make a check hmm. and uh, what what goes through your head I mean you famously have never as you just touched on you've never had a coach I mean what what's going through your head over the ball, what's what are your swing thoughts? It's just pure rhythm. That's all it ever is with me. Smooth. If as long as I have feel like I've got a smooth rhythm, take it away smooth, um, and then commit one hundred percent to the ball. That's all I'm ever really thinking about. So if I start playing badly, I'm pretty much certain that it's because I've been a bit of pressure and you whip the club away too quick. So I just go back to rhythm and then just trust the fact I've been playing. You know when I was playing, I was practicing a lot in the early days that people think I never practiced when I was younger, but that's a lot of rubbish. Yeah. Um, so you've got your, your muscle memory all in there and then it's just, can you produce under pressure with the, with, with the same thing every time and all the greatest players have got, they do the same thing every time. Mm-hmm. So what, what were your bad shots? The, what were the tendencies? Everybody's got them. Um, well, the, the, when I started having trouble in 91 with my driver, it was a massive block out to the right. And that was a mental thing. It was it was that I could go on the range and pummel 100 drivers straight down the middle. I'd get on the first tee and hit it 60 yards right. So that's where hitting off the deck actually came from. That that was my bad shot, a, a non-committal to the, to the uh, back of the ball and just horrible shot out to the right. Hmm. Was that when you started uh, dismissing the use of a tee? Yeah, that basically was. 91, my brother was caddying for me on the LPJ at the time. And, you know, we'd hit a two iron off the par five tee. Pretty decent because I could I could commit to a two iron. It was just I had a mental block with a driver. Yeah. Um, and then I'd get up with the driver off the deck and hit it on the green. And he, he'd reversed it. And he said, well, look, just and initially I'd just throw it on the on the ground on the tee. Yeah. And and I would hit it off the deck with the driver. And, and, and that's where it all started from. And then eventually just knocked up a little turf. And now it's... You know, it's as high as a tee when I'm when I'm playing really well. I, I I'll go quite a high tee if I'm not quite confident. It'll be a little bit lower tee. Yeah. So you were playing par fives as a drive. Two iron par fives were two iron drive for you. Pretty much, yeah. That that's that. <laughs> I remember. I remember, I remember um, San Diego tournament I won. You know, that was the sort of thing I was doing. And like I said, if Tony hadn't just said, maybe I'd have clicked clicked onto it at some point. But he just said, look. Let's try this because it was obviously a serious problem. If you can't hit a driver as a pro, I was lucky because I was actually long enough with my two arm. My two arm was as long as most of the other girls' drivers, so I w- I'd lost my advantage of length, but I could still play. Like I said, that week in San Diego, I won with with basically hitting a two arm, but that was the start of um, of going with the driver off the deck. Yeah, that always makes me think of uh, Mo Norman, the famous Canadian who was a wonderful ball striker. He used to sometimes play drive wedge holes with wedge driver just for fun. So it sounds like you were heading down that road a little bit. Because he could. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, he was, a bit more, he was a bit more talented than me. And I think he, uh, you know, he's one of those unbelievable... I never saw him hit a ball, but from what I understand and what I hear from people... Um, Laurie Kane was always talking about him. What well, a great Canadian player she was, or is. Um, but yeah, I'd love to have seen him hit it. But yeah, I, I like that sort of thing. People changing things a bit. So I, I think I would have got on well with him. Yeah, I could see that appealing to your sense of humour. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, I want to talk about the the US Women's Open. I mean, that that must have been a huge life changer for you. I mean, you'd been, as you said, you were playing in Europe and pretty much dominating, but. The next step was obviously America. I mean, I take it you were going to go to the tour school anyway, even if you hadn't won that. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I was I was planning to go to tour school. That I think it's normally held in October in Florida, um, but obviously won the Open in July, and um, they had to put it to a vote because it was a new thing. No one had ever won a tournament from outside of the LPGA, so they voted to give a tour card to the players. So I didn't have to go, which was obviously for me fantastic. Um, and then it turned up in America in 88 was my rookie season. Um, 
And yeah, then I but then I felt because they'd give me the card, I had to produce something. So my fifth tournament, I won in Tucson. So that was I had a bad start. I missed the first two cuts in Florida, and then not sure what I did in Hawaii, but it, I didn't miss the cuts, but it wasn't great. And then won Tucson, and I think that just everyone thinking, oh, one hit wonder from England. All of a sudden, I'd won again, and that really built my confidence in that I didn't have to prove myself anymore. Yeah, you kind of paved the way for Sofia Popov in a way. I mean, he, she did something similar just last year at Trun when she won the British Open. Yeah, there's been a few, been a few mm. Korean girls that have won the Korean swings of LPGA events, and yeah, so it, it's a, it's a really nice thing if you're not on the tour and you you win a tour, an LPGA tournament. I think you've proven that you're worthy of your spot. So yeah, it's it's nice that they, they had that vote. It wasn't unanimous that vote back in '87, but they. I can imagine. Yes, to. yes. I mean, yeah. they, they certainly that Tony Jacklin used to talk about how he wasn't exactly made welcome when he went over to the states. There was a prevailing yeah. mood that you were, they was taking their money. It was was the kind of the line that they came out with. Did Did you ever experience any of that in, in America? Um, not really. I mean, the fact they didn't vote unanimously on it obviously said something. But the, you know, when when I got there, I de- I just remember getting on really well with all the players. Julie Inkster, um, Betsy, good friends with her, Patty Shee, and I, I got on really well with them all. So I never felt anything in particular. But obviously, the great players in those days were all American. That you had Ayako Okamoto, who was a, a great foreign player. But that was pretty much it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. How how kind of jumping ahead a little bit here, but the, how has the tour changed, the LPGA tour changed in the three decades and a bit that you've been playing it? I mean, it seems to me it's obviously much more international now. I mean, the Asian players have really come in and dominated the last maybe decade and a bit. But how how else has it changed for you? Well, yeah, that's the obvious thing, isn't it? It's the fact that it's a lot of Asian players, um, a lot younger players at the top, where it used to be all the 30-plus-year-old players were the best players on tour. Now the best players are probably all under twenty-five or between, uh, well, well, under thirty certainly. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's changed beyond all recognition, really. Uh, the tournaments we have, the TV coverage, everything's bigger and better. Um, you don't quite get the camaraderie you used to have in the old days. Um, people are spread out more, and a lot of the young players that come out, they've got coaches and all this other stuff. Um, so it's maybe not as as friendly a tour as it used to be, but it's certainly a more professional and um, really good. I mean, it's I love playing on the tour still. That's why I'm still going because I actually I really enjoy it still. When you're not doing well, it's not fun. Obviously, nothing's fun when you're not doing well. How has the standard improved, and and where has it improved the most for you? Um, I think well, I, I always say they they don't hit many bad shots anymore. These girls they're because they're not as dynamic, obviously, as the men. We're not as dynamic as the men. It's it's you need more precision and honestly you can go 18 holes with some of these girls and they'll hit 13 or 14 fairways 16 of 18 greens when they don't hit the green they, it's it's just real high quality stuff um like i say it's, it's not bryson dechambeau kind of stuff but it's it's so impressive in a different way yeah i mean i, I mean i'm a big fan of the watching the women's golf especially as the the men is less actually less appealing for me because the I can't relate to the game that they play. It's so divorced from you know the norm, if you like, because they hit it so far. But the women, um, I, I I really enjoy watching the women, and that the big a big part of it is their the skill level is is exactly the same as the men. I mean, people we always make the comparisons between men and women, but the skill level to me is is pretty much the same. Oh, there's no question. The short games of some of these girls now, the top, the top, top players are, you know, they're they're as good as the guys. We we can't generate the power and the spin from the fairways, but certainly around the green, the putting, Inby Park, for instance, probably the best putter in the world, man or woman, for the last decade, I would say. Um, so yeah, I, I think the women's game's got huge amounts to offer to, to certainly the amateur game because, like you say, they can learn. You can't do what Bryson DeChambeau and Tiger and Phil Mickelson, you can't really, you can admire what they do, but you can't really emulate it. Whereas, you know, a, a decent single figure, or not single figure, but like scratch handicap goal from the men, their game, they'd probably still be a, a lot longer than the girls, but they can certainly, you can see a similarity between the games, the way they get it around the course. So I, I'd say they can definitely learn from us. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a story last year sometime where I, I think it was a four handicap guy on Twitter had announced that he reckoned he could do reasonably well on the LPG Tour. I mean, I laughed out loud when I read that. I mean, I used to play off scratch for a long time, and I, I couldn't live with these women. They're far better than a scratch golfer, a male golfer. 
Oh, yeah, it, it makes you laugh. You turn up at some of the pro-ams and you get some of the better. And, and they just think because they can hit it 40 yards past you off the tee and hit the odd decent iron and make the odd putt, that they could do that over 72 holes. Well, just look at club championship scores. It, it, and they're never 20 under up that are winning. And, and it's it's a shame that they think like that. But I do enjoy it sometimes when they when they do play in pro-ams and they do realise, and, and that four handicap guy, I play him over seventy-two holes every day of the week for any any amount of money you want because it's it's not the actual physical game; it's the pressure of, of yeah. producing under pressure when you've actually got to do it. You know, your mates all year are giving you four foot putts because it's inside the leather or whatever. All of a sudden, when you've got to make that four foot putt and it's a little bit of break on it, mm-hmm. it all changes. And it, it, it's sad that they think like that, but you know that's that's their that's their option. They can they can have that opinion, but they're nowhere near as good as these top girls. Oh god, no. um, you must see a lot of that in pro arms. I mean, there must be the the male ego must kick in when you play with these guys in, in pro arms. I mean, there must have been some examples of you know they're they're kind of puffing their chest out if they can knock one past you or whatever. Give, give me some examples of that. Oh yeah, they always let you know when they because obviously I've always had the reputation of being a long hitter. And yeah, they'd always let you know if they if they hit one past you. But uh, that you know that that I wouldn't expect to outdrive all these men over the years in the prams I've played with if they're good players. I mean, if they're sort of four, five, six handicap and they don't really hit the middle of the club all the time, then it's it, almost funny. But when, when one of the really good players gets excited about knocking it past you, then you think, well, you you know, <laughs> that's a bit weird that you'd be excited about knocking it past a girl. But yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, most of it's in good fun. I've had the odd one over the years that's, you know, you, you get a bit irritated with and your caddy gets a bit irritated with. But overall, it's all in good humour. I mean, that that's the great thing about golf, isn't it? Who hits it the furthest off the tee? So I've, I've never had any problem with that, but it does make me laugh. Yeah, I mean, it's become a big thing in the, in the modern game, certainly in the men's. And I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong in the women's game too, that how far you hit it off the tee has become, for me at least, uh, disproportionately advantageous I mean you should there should be an advantage obviously from longer shots but not to the extent that we see certainly in the men's game is it is that the same in the women's game or is it is that just something that's creeping in oh no because the way they set the courses up um, in the the, the the longer hitters in the men's game is, is just becoming a massive advantage like we're seeing with Bryson and obviously a few of the others Brooks Kepka. in the women's game it's not the same because the way the courses are set up it, the likes of I don't know, Anne Van Dam, she's probably the longest. I played with her in Saudi Arabia a couple of months ago and she was 60 yards past me on one drive and I'd hit a good one too. It wasn't like yeah. I hadn't caught mine. Yeah. You know, so that is super long hitting. But unfortunately for her, it's not really doing her any favours at the moment because the way the courses are set up, you're going to get short par fours, really long par fives, which maybe is, is an advantage. But um, the men's game, my God, some of these 515-yard par fours and – the average guys on the tour, they're going in with some serious clubs and Bryson's hitting a wedge in. I mean, it should be unbelief to me. Yeah. I mean, well, let me turn it around a little bit here. Um, at your peak, at the, the top of your game, uh, how competitive could you have been playing on the men's tour? Oh, I, I played in Freddie Couples Day over in Seattle in about 94 or something, maybe five, when I was playing at my... The, the, the sort of 93 to... 2000 were my basically when I played at my absolute best but mm-hmm. could no could still never have competed I was I played a few TV matches with Curtis Strange and Seve and I wasn't outdone massively off the tee but uh, it's it's again it's back to that pressure thing it's like that four handicapper coming in and playing on the LPGA tour not a chance because he's and it's the same with the girls you've seen it it's all very well Annika came as close as anyone to, to doing well in fact um, say we pack in Korea made the cut in a men's event so it can be done but if you're told right you can't come and play on the LPJ the rest of the year you're going to play on the PGA tour as a top woman pro I would say you'd lose your card within the first sort of six months because you might not make a cut and that's just pressure it's not because they're not any good it's just the pressure of moving out of your nice comfortable pond into that giant ocean mm-hmm. And that's just the way it is. And that's why Mr. Four Handicapper wouldn't laugh to go hungry. <laughs> yeah, so it was never a temptation for you then to give it a try? Oh, I enjoyed the events I played in. I played in a European event down in um, Australia, the match, the, the point system game. I finished second last, I think. I think 143 out of 144, something like that. Um, that was on a horrible golf course. Not a, not a horrible golf course, but a course that did not suit my game, which was a shame. 
Um, I played in a skins game in Australia and was doing and held my own there. I had a putt to win the skins game actually, but mm. Daly held a putt at the very next hole. So I really enjoyed my th- four or five goes with the guys playing against them off the same tees. But I never went there thinking, oh, I've got a chance of winning this. I always went there thinking, don't make a fool of yourself. So you're up against it before you even start. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, the, the only thing that um, I might say that I don't like it might be too strong way of putting it, but the only thing that I, I kind of shake my head a little bit at when I watch the women's tour is the hybrids, the amount, number of hybrids that they play. I'm not a fan of hybrids. I think the... They, um, they're great for amateurs because they make they're, they're obviously easier to hit. But I think at, at your level, you should be able to hit a five or a four iron, surely. I mean, that that's just maybe I'm an old fuddy duddy. But I mean, how do you feel about that? No, I'm an old fuddy duddy too. It drives me wild that these you know these players. I'll hit a I'll hit a two or say a three or a four iron beautiful shot from whatever, and then they'll be about thirty yards further out and they'll be hitting this little wedge, this little hybrid, and obviously hit it a lot closer because they are mustered with them but I think it's taken out a real art form and and the men are starting to use these hybrids as well they're they're mix and match quite a lot and yeah I've I've never liked them Lotta Neumann was the first one I think she had a seven wood years and years ago and she she was the first person I saw play up against that had them and then but five or six years later every single woman on the tour maybe myself Jane Geddes um, a few of the really good ball strikers would hit the long iron still, and I still have a two iron in my bag to this day. I haven't. I just have one wood. I just have my driver. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I wish uh, I wish the authorities had got onto that one pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, I, I, with pal of mine on the on the European tour, Nicholas Kolsarts is a magnificent long iron player, and he doesn't get anything like the benefit that he should. I mean, he's always yeah. kind of saying to me, "Why well, I I can hit this beautiful three iron and." Then I step back, and this guy steps up with his little hybrid and knocks it. You know, just the same shot, and it's not the same skill level, really, for me. No, it's it's not, and it's uh, it's not. It's obviously not cheating because that's it's part. Of, you're allowed to use them, but it's almost making the game easier artificially, and that really annoys me because I'm I'm always a purist on the best ball strikers should be the best players, and that's not certainly in the women's game. That's not always the case. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you on that, but but we are starting to sound like old fuddy duddies. I'm afraid. So. That's all right. <laughs> you can live with that, can you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've I've never been of a different opinion. I've always hated hybrids, so this is nothing new for me. I've been I've been angry about them for twenty odd years. Yeah, yeah. Um, this this podcast, Laura, is uh, is based in Australia, and you've always I know you've always been a big fan of Australia. Um, tell me why. Oh, I just love the people, the the golf courses, the weather. It's a little gets a little bit warm down there for me. Um, some of the because the time of year we go obviously is there's summer and it's so blooming hot. But mm. yeah, just the food, the just the way of life. I just think it suits me down to the ground. And a lot of my best mates are Australians. They, a lot of them live on the Gold Coast, and you know, one day it'd be nice to go and spend six months of the year out there and six months back here. That 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 would be my ultimate dream, I think, because like I said, my best mates live in that part of the world. Yeah, yeah, I can relate to that. The the only thing I don't like is the flies. All those bloody flies, they're everywhere. I'm with you again. It was, uh, flies and spiders. I don't mind snakes, but flies and spiders, I'm right there with you. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, we touched on earlier um, your aggressive style of play. Um, there's ups and downs to that. Um, tell me the highs and lows that have come from being as aggressive as you are on the golf course. Um. Well... In fact, the one time I needed to be aggressive, I wasn't. And it cost me the Nabisco, which is now the ANA tournament. I, I, me and the caddy decided we'd lay up and play it as a three-shot hole, whereas I always used to go for the 18th in two, driver, driver sometimes to that island green. So that that cost me the other way. But I've, I've been in positions where I needed to eagle the last hole to get in a playoff and walked off with a 10 and finished 30th. I've had, uh, <laughs> I had to try and uh, make the cut. No, no, I was, I had a, in Mexico, I was a, a really difficult second shot but if I make the eagle I would have been in the top I think there was only a three-round tournament I'd have been in the top five going into Sunday so I've gone for this four iron from a pretty decent distance didn't make the carry walked off with a 10 missed the cut so I've had some some really bad results from going for things but on the other hand I've won so many tournaments because I didn't back down and and uh, went for shots and made the birdie made the eagle and that's why you win. And if you if you're scared of failing, then there's no point being out there for me. If you just want, like as we were said earlier, if you just want to make the the nice paycheck, then that's fine. But I want to win, 
and you've got to be prepared to blow out sometimes. And and I've had I've had a fair few, but there you go. Yeah, yeah, you've got to be accepting of the the possibility of failure, haven't you, to do that? Oh, absolutely. There's no great winner out there that, that that's not failed on a, on a, probably more occasions than Mister Steady and Mrs. Steady, but. That's what makes the game fun. I mean, I, I can think of nothing worse than going away thinking, oh, my God, if I'd gone for that green. A player recently laid up on a par five and a good player um, and lost and ended up losing the tournament, whereas they knock it in the middle of the green, they win the tournament, and that's the end of it, end up losing. And I just thought, my God, you, you should be going for that shot. It's, yeah. it's a shame that uh, people play safe in those situations. But, you know, that's that's their mentality and... A winner's mentality is different to that. Yeah, on a slightly related subject, you mentioned the the last hole at the ANA um, in Palm Springs. Uh, what did you make of the, you know, basically what I thought was a backboard at the tournament there last ludicrous. year? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's ludicrous. I, I've played there so many times. And it, obviously, when there's people there in the grandstand, it was just an advertising hoarding this time, which made it even more ludicrous. Mm. But even when it's been the, um, even when it's just been the hospitality suite. And they always put a board or a skirt at the bottom and it would stop the ball going over. And, and for me, that's an island green. The tee should be pushed up. They should have it where people are going in there trying to hit the green. And if you pull it, you're in the water. If you push it, you're in the water. That's the that's the great aspect. And to have the backs up and just people. I mean, I've spoken to lots of players and caddies since and they've said they literally were aiming in the middle of it, hoping to hit it in the right spot and rebound down for their nice eagle chance. And that that's I mean, ludicrous for me, but. I don't, I mean, I understand it, but why not just put the advertising hoarding out in the middle of the lake? It makes no difference to the, if, even if the gallery is sitting in it, they can still see the green if you raise it up high enough. So they need to rethink that one. Yeah, it did, uh, it did the tournament, especially as it's a major, did it Did it no favours, really, in my eyes anyway. I'm sure a lot of people felt the same. So. And, I, and I, I wanted to touch on another thing, because you and I have talked about this one before, but um, I, I did say that hybrids was the one, the one thing I didn't, particularly enjoy about women's golf but there is one other thing which is uh, slightly more you know tongue-in-cheek is the the air hugging which we haven't seen the last few months because of social distancing but air hugging I used to call it the air hugging tour I mean come on let's get real here well I I, I hate hugging I, I I haven't done it I, I always walk up with the outstretched hand and yeah and there's a couple of players that love to mess with me um, um one of the um Corder sisters Jetica Corder she always, I put my hand out and she knows that I, I'm not going to go because I don't agree with it like you. Yeah. And she always says, come on, let's hug it out. And she'll always hug me. And, and you know, Inkster, if I play with her, we might have a little hug, whatever. But when you play with someone you don't really know, and I don't understand it. And it's it's the only, there's nothing good come out of COVID apart from they're not allowed to hug on the 18th green anymore on the old PGA Tour. That is the one positive from COVID. Yeah. I mean, now that you're a dame, though, you should get them to bow slightly, shouldn't you? We don't need any of that malarkey. No. <laughs> I just, I just, uh, I just think it's a professional sport. You should shake hands. That's all, that's all I'll say. Definitely. Yeah, I'm one hundred percent with you on that. And it, and it looks, it looks so false. You know, if someone's just won a tournament, that's different. If I'm on the 18th green in the final group, and whether I know them or not, if they just hold a putt to win the tournament, then one hundred percent, I think it's appropriate. Yeah. But just your box standing around a golf with two players, you know, but you don't really know hugging and pretending to care it's just ludicrous yeah well it's and they weren't even hugs i mean they're, they're air hugging i mean it was just this kind of you know people oh, kiss they go mwah, mwah, on each cheek and there's not yeah. it's not actually a kiss it's just a something i don't know what it is yeah, yeah. ask beanie about it she's the same as me beanie beanie yeah. agrees with me 100 percent. no more hugging well hopefully it'll stick now when They'll go they, when when we can go back to normal life um hopefully everyone will still not be hugging Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I touched on the, the, the dame, the fact that you're now a dame, um, which is, you know, I'm sure a, a great honour. But um, run me through the process. How did that all work? Um, well, you get a letter from the Prime Minister's office um, saying that, you know, you're being considered for this honour. Mm-hmm. And you then have to accept it, sign this lovely card that's all embossed and got your name on it. And do you accept it? You sign it, put it in the post and send it back. And then... Obviously, if you've said yes, then you'd assume you're going to get it and you're told not to tell anyone about it for, I think it was nearly four or five months before oh, I uh, got, be, got the honour from, must from have hearing been to- about torch- it. That's torture, is it not? Well, you, tell, you tell your close family, obviously. You just you don't tell any of your mates and yeah. 
anything like that. And but that's just the way it is. But no, it was it was lovely. Um, never expected it because I'd had a MBE and a CBE, and I just thought, well, you wouldn't get more than one upgrade. I mean, in that that you wouldn't have thought that uh, yeah, would happen. Yeah. And yeah, so when that came through in two thousand. I think it was 2014 I got the notification. I think I went to the palace in 2015, something like that. I can't remember the exact dates. Mm. Um, but no, amazing. My mum and stepdad and brother came to the palace with me. My dad had come before. He flew over from America to come when I got the CBE. So, no, it's, 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 it's nice for the whole family, really, because, you know, they've, they've put so much into my career as well, and they deserved it as well. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, it, it... It strikes me as slightly odd, though, the fact that, that you're a dame and you've been honoured at that sort of level, and yet you're not in the LPGA Hall of Fame. Is that something that you care too much about? Well, I haven't got enough points. That's quite a simple equation, really. I think, like, you need 27, I've got 25, something like that. Um, so, yeah, if I'm good enough, I'll get those two points. Yeah, I'm running out of time now, obviously, but that's one of the reasons I still play, because I'd love to. I know it's not going to happen, truthfully. Mm. I mean, hand on art. Yeah. Chances of winning two more LPGA tournaments at my age are not good because you get into a position maybe where you could win and that's when the real nerves kick in. Back to Mr. Four Handicapper, can you handle it? Probably not. Yeah. But, you know, I'm still here trying. Yeah. Well, here's my theory. You can shoot this down if you like, but my theory is that the, the two things are interconnected. Um, the reason, the biggest reason for me why you should be a dame is the fact that there wouldn't... I. I really don't think that there would be a women's tour in Europe if it hadn't been for the support that you gave when you were the best player in the world. And that the reason why you haven't got enough points on the LPJ tour is the same thing, that you weren't there enough. That had you played full yeah, time, I, you know. I, I agree with you. If, if I'd played on the LPGA full time like Annika and some of the other Europeans that went out there, I would, I, yeah, I, I, would, I would say 100% I'd have got those two extra points. But on the other hand, I enjoyed coming back playing with my mates in Europe and winning tournaments in Europe and and a couple of times it was almost a reset. So I had the opportunity to do that and I chose to do that. So I don't I don't have any problem whatsoever. The only problem I have about not being in the LPJ Hall of Fame. My dad lived in America for from sixty six onwards till basically he died. Mm -hmm. um, and he because he was American, he liked the Hall of Fame stuff because they are very Hall of Fame orientated out there. Not so much over here. Um, and he really wanted me to be in that LPJ Hall of Fame, and I never did it for him. And that that's the uh, that's the worst part of it. But I made my decisions, and I, I had lots of wins overseas that I I wouldn't have maybe had as many wins. So you can never look back. You can't. I've got to say, you, you can't regret doing what you did. But yeah, if I, obviously if I'd played out there at my peak, I, I would have had at least two more wins, maybe more than that. Yeah, I mean, shove your modesty aside if you can for a minute. I mean, is it too strong to say that? I mean, my view is that the the women's tour in Europe might have disappeared had it not been for the fact that you were around or played as much as you did. Oh, I, I mean, you, you, I'd like I'd like to think that I had a part in keeping the keeping it going at one point because it was looking a bit ropey. But they, the the way I looked at it was, and it's not being modest; it's just a fact. The the European tour gave me my start, and without the European tour, without those three years before I won the U.S. Open, I wouldn't have been prepared to go and win the U.S. Open. So the European tour gave me my start. So at no stage was I ever going to not play in Europe for a lot of the time. I think one in '96, I think I played 17 countries in 17 weeks. These kids now they won't play more than three weeks on the trot. Yeah. I literally, I, I've still got it upstairs in, in because I have a fold out diary. I literally played 17 weeks in 17 different countries because I was crossing back and forth and playing in Europe. And so, you know, but the other thing about um, not being in the Hall of Fame, I played in Japan a fair bit too. So that took away from the LPGA, but my sponsors were Japanese. So yeah. everything worked out the way it works out. And I've, I've come up short and I can, I can very much live with that apart from my dad's disappointed. Yeah. Where is the, the European tour, women's European tour now? What's this? It's obviously seems to me that things are on the up despite the the way the world is at the moment i mean the things are improving where, where do you how do you see it yeah well it was all looking good wasn't it until covid started we had the backing of the rna and the lpga and every and there was a really good feel to it and then what happened happened i mean obviously it's made way more important for the world than it is just the ladies european tour but we did just seem like we were getting ahead of it and um and that happened. But from what I can understand, the, the the sponsors are sticking with us and there's a good few tournaments we're playing in now. Um, we've got, you know, some different tournaments that are coming up. 
the the one thing that worries me now is that the commissioner's handed his resignation in and I was going to ask you about um, that yeah hopefully the new hopefully the new commissioner when they come in will still have the because Mike was very positive about the LET he wanted the LET to to succeed now hopefully part of the the new commissioner's remit is that they're going to have to back up what the commissioner put in place at the time and because with their support, I think we can get bigger and better. And we've got certainly got so many really good players now in the European Tour. I mean, what Emily did at the end of last year was spectacularly good. Yeah. I mean, Mike Juan is retiring uh, this year, as, as he says, um, to rave reviews. Um, it seems to me, looking at it from a distance, uh, well-earned. But uh, what's your view on that? I think he was great. My dog's just come back. I think he was great. Um, who do you think? I think he was fantastic for the Tour and... Uh, he he's left it in a really good place, to be quite honest with you. I, I got on great with him. I think he was brilliant. I think he was forward thinking um, and tried to help us, which is one of the things that I really liked about him. So, um, yeah, I, you just can't give him enough credit, to be honest with you. He put a, he started new tournaments, the you know, the, the crown tournament, the national crown one that every two years um the founders tournament at what sort of commissioner can ever get an event that you don't, the pros don't get paid. So that was a miracle in itself. So he was, he was a good salesman. And I think, I think we'll miss him. Who knows? We might get a better commissioner, but it'd be hard act to follow. Yeah. I interviewed him a couple of times and uh, I have to say, no one has ever packed more words into a 20 minute interview than Mike Juan. Yeah. He can talk. Well, that's a good salesman, isn't it? They can well, talk. Yeah. There's no question about it. Absolutely. What what um what would you say has been the biggest difference that he's made then over the I think eleven years he's been in the job? TV, I think, is one of it was his biggest thing when he turned out. He wanted the LPGA on TV. He's achieved that. It's around the world every single week now. You know, we get it live in England on Sky. It's everywhere, Australia, wherever you are now. You can see the LPGA, which eleven years ago you couldn't say that. So that was his for me. That was what he always wanted. He knew that was the way forward for the tour. And that's helped with sponsorship, big prize money, you know, big blue chip companies, CME and KPMG. He's brought all the big names to the table and they all seem to really love what the LPJ do- does for them. So he's created a really good atmosphere with the players and the sponsors. Yeah, he's got a good product to work with now as well. I mean, the number of good players is, it must be, well, you tell me. I mean, how many more good players are there now than when there was, say, 20 years ago? Oh, well, when I when I was on tour, you know, you'd probably look at 20, 25 players and think, oh, I've got to worry about you this week. Now you've got to worry about 100 plus every single week. And obviously the best players are always still going to be the best players. They're the most consistent, um, make fewer mistakes. But overall, you can have, you know, you can have any, a lot of the young girl that just won the US Open come out, come out of nowhere. She's, you know, another great player that, that handles the pressure. Doesn't seem to worry about uh, playing abroad. You know, she she played a few years in Korea yeah. on their tour system over there. Um, yeah, so every year there's more and more great players coming out, which is which can only send the standard up. What what the LPGA needs is a lot of good young American girls. Now they've got some. Lexi obviously is nearly there, but you know doesn't quite probably win as much as as would be good for the tour. But yeah, it's it's in a really strong place. I mean, this is. Touching on a, a, a touchy subject, if you like, but the as you say, the LPJ is an American-based tour. A, an awful lot of the dominant players now, or the better players, are not American. Is that been a a commercial issue for the tour in a little in in a not a good way, but in a realistic way? Well, I think what's happened is you've gone from that you've got your main American events, but now there's a lot more events around the world. We go to Korea, Japan. Mm. Um, seeing all these other places because these Asian players, the the Asian countries want uh, tournaments in their part of the world now. So what we've lost in America, we've gained in Asia and obviously Europe. They come over here for, there's going to be at least three this year, maybe four LPJ events in Europe. And and it's it's made it a more international tour. Um, the fact that most of the really top players are, are, are South Korean, Japanese, it's up to the rest of the world's players to step up and be better. I mean, it's it's not these girls' fault. They're just very good, and they're and they're they're a good crack as well. They're really nice girls. These girls at the top, and fair play to them. So we can't complain about it. We just got to beat them because they they're setting the standard. You know, years ago it was the Swedes. They they would dominate. You had Annika and Lotta, yeah, and, and yeah. they had a really good run. And and obviously the Americans for the first 
part of the LPGA's history was dominant with the American players, but it's just, I don't know if it's good for the LPGA in America, but it's certainly good for the LPGA around the world. Yeah, I mean, I've always uh, there's always been talk of world tours, certainly in the men's game. We're not nowhere close to that yet, although we're getting closer, I think, with the new deal between the European Tour and the PGA Tour. But I've always argued that the women were, were always going to be first to do that because it just made sense. Yeah, well, we've already done it, really. We start in Australia, then we go to Asia, then America, and then Europe, and then at the end of the year, go back to Asia after the last American tournament. So we play around the world. You can you can literally play 40-something tournaments a year on the LPGA, and, and most of them, well, not most of them, but a lot of them will be abroad. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, we've got huge amounts of international players playing in huge amounts of international destinations. So... I think the old PGA Tour is the world tour already. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, you, it, if it's not there, it's it's very, very close to that. Yeah, um, we've touched a little bit on um, you know the number of really good players, um, but who have been the best players that you've competed against over the years? I'd and say what? the best was Irena Ochoa. She'd be my number one. Um, Annika, obviously, you can't you can't preclude Annika for any list. I'd say. Um, well, they're all Hall of Famers, actually, when you think about it. So mm. I was going to say Kari Webb. Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't expecting you to stick Amy your neck Pat. out here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like there's no one, really. It's, it's pretty obvious who they are. Uh, Ayako Okamoto, uh, in her day, was just unbelievably good. She, I mean, she, one, of my, one of her caddies was once told on the 14th hole to start writing her speech for her. Mm. <laughs> and she, you know, she ended up winning by five or six or whatever it was, but he thought... I've never had that before. A player yeah. telling me to start the speech five holes from the end. Yeah. She was only one ahead at the time. Yeah. She was she was a bit special, Ayako. Um, but yeah, there's no surprises there because the best players are the best players, and that they win all they win most of the tournaments. Yeah. And what was so special about Lorena? Um, I've played with her so much, and she, she was so long and straight off the tee. She her distance control was good. Probably not as good as Annika or, or Inby Park distance control, but. She had every part of her game. She was a decent putter without being a great putter. You know, lovely short game and an absolute top girl as well. She used to put get when she won a tournament, she'd deliver beer to the greenkeeper's shed and stuff like that. So they could have thanks very much for all your hard work. And she was just the overall package for me. But I think I think she was she didn't win as many as Annika, but for me, she was slightly better than Annika overall. I don't I don't, I don't know why I say that. And it's just just my impression when I was playing with her I always felt like I was in a bit of trouble yeah I mean I was disappointed uh, when when she retired I mean I obviously you understand the reasons she was she wanted to get married and have a family which is you know a bit more important than golf but uh, it was disappointing that she, she didn't hang around a bit longer certainly for me anyway yeah no I, I think it was a bit of a shock and when when it happened but yeah she'd obviously made this she'd done so much well she didn't have much else to prove to be quite honest with you mm. and yeah and it was just um it was it was a shame because her and Annika had a real rivalry going, but uh, yeah, she was certainly she was certainly missed for a while. But people get forgotten about really quickly, and then the new great young players, Inby Park, and all these others come through, and so young Rue, they yeah. and all of a sudden people forget about the great players. Um, but uh, she she was certainly one of the best for me. Yeah, would you like to see more um, interaction between the the women's game and the men's game? I mean, I, I've been down at the Vic Open in Australia as you have last two or three years and that seems to work well in fact I, I'd like to have seen it mixed up even more and have the women playing alongside the men in the same groups you know that would be seem to me a logical extension but uh, it, it worked really well I mean what how did you view it from your position yeah well I think when, when you play men, men and women I think that's the best format I don't like it when you both play for the same purse from different tees because they never get the tees right they don't get the tees right at the Vic Open I mean it's embarrassing yeah. oh yeah mm. How poor the golf courses are set up over there, it's embarrassing. But I just think the men's group, women's group works. Like you say, maybe it'll be difficult because you want leaders against leaders on the weekend. You don't, yeah. if you had two guys and a girl, then the girl wouldn't know what the, you can't put pressure. Yeah. So I'm not sure I'd want to go with that format. But well, maybe the first two days. Yeah, that, that, could, that could work, definitely. But yeah, when it comes down to the weekend, you need to look your opponents in the eye. But yeah, no, I, I, I love the Vic format and I'm surprised that other people haven't jumped on the bandwagon yet because it, it really works. It seems like the guys enjoy it. Maybe they don't. They tell us they do. And, and I really do think they do because um, the standard of play, the way they set the courses, that makes it look like the guys are much better because they're winning scores always double as. Their top T 
10 score is better than our winning score and and it annoys me because we we play the par five eighth on the on the other course and uh, we've got a four yard advantage i hit like last year i hit driver driver on the front edge and the group of the guys behind me all hit two nine irons and an eight iron par five Mm. because i asked their caddies afterwards what did you hit in there and see that that sort of thing really winds me up. Uh, it, it's it makes it where we haven't got a chance. You, they give you an advantage on a par four that's irrelevant, and then they put the par five tees together. But anyway, that that's a side point. But that that particular um, tournament, I think, works really well, and there's real potential for it if the men want to do it. it. It'd be obviously the girls would be up for it because it's really good for us to be associated with the the PGA Tour and the European Tour. Yeah, I mean, I think you. I mean, I can confirm that you're dead right about the the course setup. I actually caddied for Bini, uh, Katrina Matthew, um, a couple of years ago in that event, and especially the last day when they toughened up the pin positions, the clubs that she was being asked to hit to those pin positions meant that she was putting from 25, 30 feet just about every hole. She couldn't. She was hitting six irons at pins that were wedge pins for the men. You know, they were able to get closer much much more readily than than she was, and. So that that is a very very difficult thing, I think, to set the course up the same to have the same challenge for the men and the women. I I I'd be, I'll, I'll disagree there. I don't think it is that different. All you do is make the par fives comparable because par fours, you know, they they are what they are. But the men make hay on the par fives. We're struggling to make pars on the par fives, and that's that's the biggest difference in scoring. If if you're getting three, four, five eagles a week on par fives, as the guys do. Um, and we're getting, if you get a chance, maybe one a week, if you're lucky, on those 16 par fives. Mm. That's where you set the course up for me. The par threes, you can you can make them as easy or as difficult as you want for both tours. And the par fours, as long as you don't go, we're at 340 and the guys are at 490, that, that would be too far the other way. But it, for me, it would be very easy to set that course up in a really fair way. And I bet you I could get the scores pretty similar. Well, I'll, I'll put you in touch with the the organisers. You can you can set the course up next time. They don't listen to a word I say. I've been saying this for thirty years. The LPGA, because since actually since the LPGA took over that event, the scores have become bigger because the LPGA's got a a problem with giving us a chance to make eagles. So when it was a European tour event and an ALPG event, the scores were much closer. Mm, I can see I've stuck a nerve with that one, Laura. Oh, it drives me mad. Yeah, right. the, the, the course setup and the women's game drives me insane because it's it's really poorly done. Mm, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll move on. Um, inevitably, we need to talk about the Solheim Cup, a uh, big part of your professional life. Um, you played in the first 12, I think I'm right in saying, uh, more than anybody else at this point. Um, your relationship is changing with the, with the event, but... Um, to me, it's uh, it's been one of the great success stories in, in the women's game. I mean, it was an obvious thing to do, obviously, because the Ryder Cup took off in the way it did when Europe got involved. But um, it started on pretty low key back at Lake Nona. I mean, I remember I was working at Golf Digest in the States back then, and hardly anybody noticed, I have to say, in 1990. But it kind of took off when you won next time at Dalmahoy. Run, run me through your relationship with the Selheim Cup. Oh, I just love it. I mean, the first, the first uh, one, like you said, at Lake Nona, very. It was very low key in that there was not much press or TV. Mm. But we were playing against eight Hall of Famers, or what would become Hall of Famers, and we were a bunch of of, of European players, not really knowing what was going on. So we really enjoyed it. The space shuttle launched that week, so we got to sit out and watch that. We thought, well, this is good. They put on a shuttle for us, but yeah. <laughs> that was a big thing. Apart, apart from the fact we got flogged. I think everyone really enjoyed it, and we thought, right, when we go, and then when we went to Down the Hoy the next time, two years later, it was uh, players of ten, so we were at an even bigger disadvantage, really, because yeah. we felt our top eight had a better chance than our top ten against theirs, because just because of the class difference at that time, and it all came together. Um, we we played great. Um, they they didn't like the weather particularly, and there were lots of delays, rain delays, and the greens were flooded and everything. But uh, somehow we muddled through and we beat them. And, and I think I, I say that's one of the biggest shocks in sport, the fact that we won that. People forget about the difference in, I mean, world they go on about world rankings now. The world ranking difference would have been mm. in the thousands if, if you'd gone back then, because all the top players were obviously American back then. So that was obviously got it on the map. Then it was just fun after that. We won, we've won a few. I think we've won five or six now of the, the versions of it they're still ahead obviously um but i think over the next five or six competitions you'll find that maybe the europeans 
regret you get that balance back up a little bit mm. um i i love playing in it i love the team side of it you know playing with trish johnson and um mel and all these other players i was paired with and it, it's it's the most fun you had really as a pro because you don't normally play as a team member and you get the chance to do that and I, i've only got good memories the losses were they hurt for a minute and then you thought oh well we, we've had a good crack this week and mm-hmm. with your mates and, and and on to the next one yeah, I mean, in retrospect, and with the benefit of hindsight, obviously, I think that that win at Dalmahoy was hugely important because it, if you'd been hammered again, you know, the interest level might have drifted off. Yeah, yeah, it was important that we did what we did. There's no question about it because, you know, there, there were rumblings after after about nine or ten Solheim Cups, and and the Americans were still. I don't know what the actual equation was, but they were still ahead of us, and there was talk of bringing the Asians into it, and mm. and it was just a nonsense, really. There was no need for it. The fact that we weren't beating them every time, but now we've beaten them enough where you don't hear that anymore, and you don't people don't want that. They just want the rivalry, like the Ryder Cup is. It's Europe against America, mm-hmm. and the best team wins. So it's established itself now that uh, it's a fair contest. And and let, let's face it, the the one we won, it came down to the last putt. If the American girl holds her putt, we lose. It's it's it, that's how that's how it should be. And hopefully, the next four or five salons will be the same because it was so exciting. You you'll never if you watched it as a movie, you say, "Oh, what a load of rubbish! What's the point?" The girl she gets picked. She's you know yeah. just become a mother. She doesn't really play anymore. Holds the winning putt. It's, it was ludicrous, really. Yeah, I mean, it was. It's it's as good a sporting event as. I mean, I've been to a lot of golf tournaments over the years, and that's that's that one is as good as I've been to. Certainly, in terms of drama and excitement. I mean, as you just said, I mean, you, if you'd scripted it, it would have been thrown out even by Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, it'd have been embarrassing. Yeah. Now, um, <clears throat> over the years, I'm 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 almost fed up of hearing that Laura Davis doesn't want to be the captain in the Solheim Cup. I mean, how many times has that been trotted out? But you were vice captain the last time, Dabini. Um, did that come close to changing your mind? Is there a prospect of Laura Davis leading the troops into battle at some point? Not really. I mean, I I, I enjoyed the vice captaincy. Equally, I enjoyed doing the TV. So it's um, I, I, I did after I didn't play. Now I think I did the first two or three TV, and then obviously. When Beanie asked me, I was never going to say no. I look for, and I really enjoyed it, and I'm really looking forward to the next one as well. Uh, but as for being captain, I, I, it's not something I think. Oh, I can't wait to do that. I really don't want to do it. The pressure everyone keeps going on and on about it. But I, I don't see what the big deal is. I get people all the time in my ear. You've got to do it. Well, why have I got to do it? I'm a player, not a, not an administrator. And that's basically what a captain is. And Beanie, Beanie's one of the best there is. She's motivating the players with her calm. With her there were no great speeches from Beanie. She just mm. she was Beanie, and that was good enough to make those players want to win for her. And I think that's why they dug deep on that final Sunday and and brought it home because they really wanted to win for her because she's such a good character. So, which part of your temperament rebels at being captain? Then, what what makes you it's think? That you, just... do, do you think you wouldn't be any good at it? Is that the reason we? You know... Oh, I couldn't care less about the the winning or losing side of it. I mean, I want to win one hundred percent. That that's not. I just there's so much goes on at a Solheim Cup eighteen months before. You'd have to give it. And while I'm still playing, and I know I'm not playing at a level where I'm winning every week, but I don't see how you. I mean, Beanie's game suffered for it when she when she. You know, there's no question about it. And. And when I give up playing, maybe I'll be too old. I won't. I won't know the players well enough. Um, that side of it, I don't know. But I, there's no part of me. Oh God, I'm really looking forward to being the Solheim Cup captain because I'm not. It would. It would be. It would be something I didn't want to do, but I would be doing it because other people kept going on about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what was the what was the vice captain experience like then? Oh, it was great fun. You 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 know helping out with the team and involved in the discussions with Beanie she made all the decisions we backed her up on a few of them that that you know she asked our opinions and we all we all gave an opinion um and then helping the team out at any chance she had it, it was all there was no bad side to it vice captain there'd be no bad side to it being the captain but uh, it's just all that goes with it as I didn't have to do I'm not saying I'm, I'm lazy but you you have to do so much as a captain I I yeah. I I don't know that I want to do that. Yeah, if it was a three-day job, you'd be up for it then. Oh yeah, if they said right, you can come in on Wednesday hmm. and be the captain. I'll be there. It's the eighteen months before that I don't fancy. Yeah, now, but you must have helped out. I mean, you, you touched on that there. I mean, you, you helped out. Where 
can you think of a specific example of where you thought you made a difference talking to a player or giving them advice or whatever? Oh, you'd have to ask the players that. You know, you, you, you're meeting them off the greens and you're, you're encouraging them. And whether it makes any difference, I don't know. Personally, for me, when I was playing, if you had one of the vice captains come up, you think, oh, go away, just leave me alone, let me do it. That, that, was, my, that was just me. Whether some of these players... Murph- Bloody dog. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Murphy. I've got to stop this dog for a second. Okay, take your time. Come here. Stop it. You bad boy. Knock it off. This is live radio or live podcasting for you. <laughs> Sorry about that. My dog's right. an operation on his right. tail and he will oh. not leave it alone. Right. But anyway, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I was of the opinion that just let me get on with it when I'm on the course. So whether when you go up to them and say something to them, encourage them, they, they might be thinking the same thing as I used to think. Yeah. But yeah. that's just individuals and it's just the way it is. Mm. So um, let's we're fin- getting near the finish of this, but the uh, – the future for Laura Davis. I mean, you've you mentioned you dabbled in commentary, which you're very good at, by the way. Um, is that something that you can see doing more and more as you play less? Oh yeah, definitely. That that's mm. what I'd I'd like to do. I'm doing a few more with Sky this year. I've just heard of the ones I'm going to do, so mm-hmm. I look forward to them. Whether it's at the venues uh, or whether it's in the studio, who knows? With with COVID, um, but I'm still going to play between ten and twenty a year. Just depends on how much commentating I do. So. I've just worked out a schedule. It's about 15 on the LPGA Tour this year, if I play in all of them. Um, but, yeah, I'm just doing doing what I do, really. What uh, events are you going to commentate on? Is any, Are there any men's stuff or is it all women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ryder ride Cup, um, men's, uh, British Open men's, British Open women's, um, the ANA, the, the US Women's Open, I think three... I'm doing. I'm doing. In a couple of weeks, I'm doing one of the men's events. Uh, it's up against the first LPJ event, so I'm only in the studio for that. But doing the doing those two, so yeah, it's uh, it's something I'd like to do. It's it's like you say, it's fun. Um, no pressure. You just sit there talking about what you know. Mm-hmm. So I find it quite easy, really, to talk about golf because I love golf. Yeah. Do you fancy being out on the course? I could see you being a kind of David Ferty type figure out there describing the shots. Yeah. I know there's some talk of doing a few, maybe on court, doing a bit of on course. I, I did that years ago for the BBC when uh, I used to do the British Open. Right. Um, I used to be on course. So I know on course is a bit frustrating because you can be ready for something to say and obviously they don't come to you and, and it's wasted. So on course I find a bit frustrating. But, you know, if that's what they want me to do, then then I'll do whatever Sky or Golf Channel or whoever, if I get to work for them, that that's what I'll do. Mm-hmm. Is your approach to um, does your approach to commentating have anything in common with your approach to playing? Um, I just say it how I see it. Really, that's that's pretty much I've hit. I've always hit the shots how I see them, and mm-hmm. and my commentary is a bit similar. I mean, I'm not. I'm never trying to be mean to anybody, but if I think someone's chicking out on a shot or or making a stupid error, I'll, I'll always say it. I'm never going to just because they're my mates. I mean, like Suzanne at the Solheim Cup in uh, when she, with the incident with the given part not given part right i got i got a bit of stick off her family for that but at the end of the day i didn't agree with what she did and i i don't think about it i just say it because i you know how i would have a normal conversation and that that's my style of commentating and mm-hmm. and people seem to like it and so but that that i wouldn't change if they didn't like it i wouldn't change because that's you you've got to do what you do you can't worry about what other people think yeah so you you're not worried about losing a friend or two along the way Oh, I don't think I'd ever say anything where you'd lose a friend. I mean, Suzanne and I have spoken about it quite a few times and we still disagree. Mm-hmm. But if you lose a friend over over a comment like that, I mean, she I'll say it now, she she knows she was wrong. She'd never admit it. But, you know, yeah. that's just that's just um, a difference of opinion. So, no, I, I would never say anything where I thought someone would genuinely take offence. It's only reacting to what's been done, not personal stuff. No yeah. way. Well, the reason I ask that is because... Um... Dottie Pepper, who you, you and I both know, um, she's certainly lost friends amongst the players over her commentary over the years. I mean, there is that inherent danger. I mean, you say that you wouldn't want to lose friends, and, and absolutely fair enough, but players can be awfully touchy. Well, they're, they're, are they really your mates? If they're that touchy that they would... I mean, if I don't know... I don't know any player that I've commentated on. In fact, I've had them come up and their parents have come up and said, oh, thanks very much for what you said. In fact, Bryson DeChambeau's dad saw me at the airport at the Ryder Cup and he came, him and his brother came over to me and introduced themselves. 
Mm-hmm. And I must have said something nice about Bryson. Right. And they were really pleased. So you, you get the other side of it too. I'm sure I've upset some people, but mm-hmm. it can never be to the point where they weren't your mates anymore. That that, that would just be ludicrous. And well, you'd have to be personal to upset yeah. someone that much, I think. But yeah. yeah, maybe it's slightly different in journalism, but um, you probably won't be surprised to hear that I've had a few... Um, conversations shall we say with players after i've written something that they didn't particularly like <laughs> but but broadcasting's different i mean i think there's there's more um scope for criticism can even constructive whatever kind of criticism you want to call it in journalism than there is in broadcasting they don't i don't think they really you know you get closer than most to to the telling the truth but um i'm not sure that that's really what's wanted on television most of the time i think i think the thing is with with someone like me doing it um, I've been there and done that sort of thing. And mm. I think sometimes pros take criticism off pros. Maybe, I mean, maybe Dottie said some stuff that people really didn't like. I hadn't heard any of that, but, mm. um, but I don't, I don't think I'm critical. I just make comment on what people do. And mm-hmm. if, if I think they're doing it wrong, I'll, I'll say that. I mean, if, if someone makes a stupid mental error, then why wouldn't you point it out? Cause that's yeah. interesting for people yes. watching that. In, and it's only my opinion that they, that their mentality be different mine's the ultra aggressive way of playing mentality yeah. mm-hmm. but um yeah i mean hopefully you don't upset people but i certainly wouldn't even worry about it or even i don't even think about it yeah i mean i'm, I'm still you and i have talked about this before you probably don't remember but i'm on suzanne peterson's side on that concession thing be, simply because the american girl had been told before she'd done it before and been told don't do that again and then she did it you know you only you only get one chance with that yeah, but the, the 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 flip side of that is all the uproar that it caused. Uh, I blame the captain more than I blame Suzanne, and I've said that she should have conceded the eighteenth hole, taken what happened on there, conceded the eighteenth hole, and then everything would have calmed down again. But uh, you've you must have spoken to Beanie about this, and she when I saw her on the first tee when she was going out to play her singles an hour or so later. She was, or not even an hour, she was shocked. She said, what's going on? And she said she walked into the team room and the whole atmosphere had changed. Mm. So if that hadn't happened, we'd have won that Solheim Cup. We wouldn't have lost that Solheim Cup. So that's why Suzanne was wrong. She should have just let it go and got on with it. And the other thing is that any controversy that's ever been caused in any of the history of any Solheim Cups has been American started. Mm. Um yeah. But we've never, we've never done something controversial like that in the spirit of the game, in my opinion. So that's why... I thought Suzanne was wrong because it just changed the whole attitude. Yeah. Um, my last question, um, Laura, was was kind of, again, t- slightly tongue-in-cheek. Um, you, you've been fined more than once over the years for, for certain things. Um, you want to run me through a couple of those? That I mean, I know you've been watching television during tournaments and disappearing um, off to Las Vegas, and uh, I think you got fined early on for wearing the long coloured trousers or something bizarre. Oh, you didn't? Okay, go for it. Um, well, yeah, just the, the first fine I ever got was at that tournament at Hennessy where I finished second, and, and I'd worn these my go-to pair of trousers in the amateur days. They were a blue pair of trousers. They weren't denim. Mm-hmm. And Colin Snape at the time was the head of the WPGA, and he decided he would fine me. Just before I went up on the stage to get my second-place money, Steve and Jan Stevenson had won it. Mm-hmm. And obviously it really upset me. And Jan, Jan and I have been friends ever since because of that because she felt so gutted for me that it's my second-ever pro tournament. And it had been ruined by Colin Snape coming up to me. It was only a 50 euro fine. Yeah. Or was it euros in those days? Probably not even euros in those days. But anyway, so that was a fine. I got fined uh, by one of the LPJ commissioners. I said something about a course after the round and mm-hmm. got a thousand dollar fine for that. The Vegas trip, no, that was just a trip and oh, we right. managed to get back yeah. to our tea time. So that wasn't <laughs> a fine. Um, right. The one for watching the TV during the final round of the Evian, that was a fine. I think that was 50 euro or 100 yeah. euro. So not too bad. Yeah. I've well, stayed well, away from controversy, really. The one time I should have been fine was at Evian when I smashed all the heads off those roses when the <laughs> official didn't give me a drop in the back of the 18th green in that mulch. It was about yeah. two foot of mulch and they made me play from it. And I lost my temper there. I was surprised I didn't get fined for that. But I think they knew they'd made a stupid decision, so they let me off. Yeah. On that note, um, I thank you for your time, Laura. Uh, it's been, as ever, it's been great to talk to you. Um, I'm sorry we had a couple of technical issues to start with, but um, it was nice to see you. And it's a great picture. I take it that's your mother on the on the wall behind you, is it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a lovely yeah, picture. Yeah, it last November, just over a year ago. So, yeah, that's... Uh... Oh, it's close by me. And and when will we see you back on the course? You said six weeks. Where where do you start? Uh, yeah, the 
two two tournaments in Florida, Ocala and Gaines Gainesboro or Gainesfield in Florida. So two out there. Um and then after that probably yeah, another two in America, maybe Hawaii and LA. So it's a slow kind of a slow start because I wouldn't do the Asian run. Um I'm not in those ones. Um, yeah, but middle of the year looks quite interesting. Some commentary and some uh, some really good tournaments. So I'm looking I'm looking forward to this year. I just hope that COVID doesn't uh, ruin everything again. Well, if anybody was unsure why Laura Davies is such a popular figure in the game, I trust that that chat with Huggy has helped to explain why her best playing days may be behind her, but golf is richer for the Dames' continued involvement, both on course and in the commentary booth. Well, that wraps up episode 35 of The Thing About Golf, but I hope you've made the effort to subscribe because we'll be back to do it all again with one of Australia's finest when Matthew Goggin joins us on episode 36 of The Thing About Golf. <laughs>